Welcome back to Private Pilot Ground School. This video is two of two on airplane systems. Most aircraft have either a 14 or a 28 volt DC electrical system. DC stands for direct current and that means that the electricity only flows in one direction, like a AA battery from one end into the other. Your airplane will have a battery that can provide a certain amount of current for a specific amount of time. For example, let's say that you have a 24 volt 17 amp hour battery. That means that the battery can provide 17 amps for one hour. Now each electrical thing in your airplane will draw current. Your lights might be 10 amps, radios might be 7 amps. If nothing else is on, the battery by itself can power those two things for one hour. If you have a load of 34 amps or twice that, the battery will last a half an hour. Of course, if we only had the battery all by itself, it would be pretty useless since it would eventually run out of juice. So we have an alternator. This is an engine driven battery charger. Usually an alternator is a few volts higher than the battery. So it will be 28 volts instead of 24. This is so that the entire electrical system can be powered and so the battery can get charged at the same time. Your alternator is connected by a belt to the propeller shaft and this is something else that you need to check during your preflight. If the belt is loose or broken, you might not have electric power once the airplane starts. The electrical system has an on-off switch that we call the master switch. And it's a red split switch with one side turning off the alternator and the other side turning off the battery. Here's an electrical diagram for a Cessna 152. The battery is at the bottom, the alternator is at the top, and if you follow those lines, eventually you'll get to the primary bus. Think of this bus as a power strip. You can think of the battery and the alternator as the outlet in the wall that you plug in a power strip into. And so your bus is like a power strip and then individual things can be plugged into it via circuit breakers. So in this example you see a fuel quantity indicator, a beacon, pitot heat strobe lights and a couple other things plugged into that primary uh, bus. Now we have another uh, connection that goes to a second bus and you have additional things plugged into it. So it's like a power strip plugged into another power strip. Like I mentioned before all the individual components are plugged into the bus by circuit breakers. A circuit breaker is basically a connector that connects the thing you're trying to power to the bus. If a circuit breaker pops, there is no current flowing through and the respective item is turned off. Circuit breakers are really cool because they shut things off if there's too much current flowing through and so instead of your radio getting fried and becoming completely unusable, the circuit breaker will just pop and your radio will turn off. Based on the airplane and the complexity of your electrical system, you could have many buses, couple alternators, couple batteries, and then a headache after trying to figure out how it all connects together. In either case, if you can understand and follow the diagram, you can usually figure out how the systems work. Now on most systems, we have an ammeter or a voltmeter. They measure the rate of discharge of the electrical system or the load on the system in amps. Most systems also have a low voltage light that will tell you when the alternator isn't producing power. When it comes to fuel system, there are two primary types gravity feed or fuel pump. In high wing airplanes like Cessnas, the fuel is above the engine so it can be fed by gravity down to the engine. In low wing airplanes like Pipers and Cirruses, the fuel is below the engine and in most cases needs to be pumped up into the engine. Both types of systems use an engine driven pump once the engine is running. Our fuel quantity gauges are only legally required to be correct when they're empty so make sure you're visually checking the fuel before you go flying. Aviation fuel is color coded. Most airplanes will take 100 low lead and it's blue. There's also octane 100 which is green or octane 80 which is red. The most popular and most available fuel is 100 low lead and that's what you will be using. Jet A is used for jet or turbine engines and it's colorless and it smells like pickles. And that last part is just my opinion. When you're refueling, there's a danger of static electricity igniting the fuel, or more specifically the fumes from the fuel. So we always ground the airplane to the fuel pump in order to prevent the fuel from catching on fire. This is a diagram of a Cessna 152. You have two fuel tanks and a vent on the left hand side, and you also have a vent in the fuel cap on the right hand side. You can see how they're interconnected also. Now we have screens in each of the fuel tanks and this is where you sump the fuel and where you check for contaminants. Then it flows down into uh, through another strainer and to the engine to the carburetor. 
and the first thing that says to the engine it goes through an engine primer basically when we start the engine we don't have a fuel pump in a Cessna and so there is absolutely no fuel in the engine when you start it so we have a primer it's kind of like a syringe that you squirt a couple times into the engine to get some fuel in there so when you crank it over with the starter it'll actually fire and then as the engine turns it'll turn the fuel pump the engine driven fuel pump and it'll suck more fuel in um, with the assist of gravity so that's why there's two little sections that say two engine this is a Cirrus SR22 fuel system we won't get into it but I just wanted to show you how complicated they can get um, it's still fairly easy once you follow the fuel lines and where the fuel goes but it's a little bit more complex than a Cessna 152. There are two types of propellers in use today. Fixed pitch and constant speed. And you really can't tell the difference by looking at them from the outside. But if you take a peek inside you can tell by the blue propeller knob that it's a constant speed propeller. A fixed pitch propeller is efficient only at a certain airspeed and RPM. Those propellers can be designed to be either good for climb or cruise and most are a mixture of both and the tachometer will show the engine power in RPM. Now when you first start flying, you'll be flying an airplane with a fixed pitch propeller. So you only have a throttle and a mixture control and no propeller control. In a constant speed propeller, the RPM is maintained the same and you can adjust the RPM to suit your needs whether you're in a climb, cruise, or descent, etc. The engine power will be shown by a manifold pressure gauge and not the RPM gauge since the RPM stays the same. The propeller RPM is adjusted using the blue prop that's in the cockpit. I know that was an extremely quick overview of propellers, so if you want to see an in-depth video on how constant speed propellers work, please leave a comment in the uh, comments below and uh, I'll make one for you. Superchargers and turbochargers do the same thing, but they work slightly differently. A supercharger is geared to the engine and so it uses the engine power to spin a turbine that will accelerate and pressurize air. The higher pressure air can mix with a lot more fuel and that adds to the performance. In other words, the airplane feels like it's at a lower altitude where there's a lot more air. Because the supercharger is geared to the engine, it can be very inefficient since you're using engine power to get more power for the engine. So all you're doing is increasing fuel burn, basically. Turbochargers, on the other hand, use exhaust gases to drive a turbine to pressurize air. This once again allows for a more richer air mixture or more pressurized air and more power to the engine. Now since exhaust gases are used, the turbocharger is a lot more efficient because exhaust gases were gonna get discarded anyway. And this is it, you made it through systems. Obviously I covered them really quick and in very little detail, so for more information, please check out the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. And also, read your POH Chapter 7. Uh, it'll explain your aircraft systems to a lot greater detail and it'll be airplane specific. Thanks for watching. And as always, have fun, fly safe, and always keep learning. See you next time.